our, our text really is that entire first lesson from Acts that we heard read just a few moments ago. As we continue our study of Paul, his journey to Jerusalem, his arrest there, and all that was to take place uh, subsequent to that. The year is 1986. A new movie is released by the name Stand By Me. It was directed by Rob Reiner. It was based on a story by Stephen King. It's about four 12-year-old boys coming of age as they undertake a long and arduous hiking trip seeking a dead body. Along the way, they have many adventures. They even face some danger and friendships and bonding are taking place. There's one very vivid scene that I will never forget, and perhaps some of you will remember it too. The boys need to cross a long, broad river. And they either have to walk five miles down the river, cross, and then five miles back up, or they walk across a train trestle. The train trestle is approximately 1,000 feet long. They get halfway across, and yeah, you guessed it, here comes a local freight. They turn, and they run to the other end. One of the boys is not as athletic as the rest of them. He's a little on the chunky side, and he keeps stumbling and falling. But one of the others stays with him, helps him to his feet, and even though he's in danger too, he sticks with him. This chunky guy falls a second time, but the guy will not let him go. He gets him back on his feet, and they run, and they, right at the last possible moment of escape, he gives the chunky kid a push, and the both of them, over the side, they roll down the long gravel bank, but they are safe. Scraped, bruised, but safe. That was a picture of friendship. He stood by his man. At the end of the movie, the narrator, who was one of the boys, now grown up, he's writing his memoir, and he's the one who's the narrator for the whole movie. But he draws this conclusion. He says, I never had friends later on like I had when I was 12. Jesus, does anyone? And then as the credits roll, we hear a song by Ben E. King titled Stand By Me. And of course, that's where the movie got its title. And the words go something like this. When night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we see, no, I won't be afraid. Oh, I won't be afraid just as long as you stand by me. Now, St. Paul could have sung that song, had it been written at that time, or he could have sung a song just like it, sitting there that night in prison. Now, remember, he had gone to Jerusalem. He had good intentions. He was bringing relief from the Gentile churches to the church in Jerusalem. There was a famine going on, so he was bringing a gift. He is confronted by the enemies of the gospel, the Jewish authorities. He's hauled before the, uh, the Sanhedrin. Paul gives his testimony there. And yet the reaction to his testimony is so hot, they threaten to tear him to pieces right there on the spot. And finally, the Roman authorities step in, they take Paul, they put him in jail for his own safety. But there he spends the night alone, in the dark. You can imagine what he might have been feeling. Paul was no stranger to trouble. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he gives an impressive list of the number of times he was arrested, thrown in prison, beaten, flogged. Number of times, too, that he faced other kinds of dangers, shipwreck, being adrift in the sea for three days, facing wild beasts. So he was no stranger to threats and trouble. On many occasions, the Lord knew Paul's crisis, and he knew what Paul might be going through, that he needed encouragement, and he found a way to speak to Paul, sometimes through a vision, sometimes through a vision of uh, when he's in a trance. But he always spoke words of encouragement. But this time, we're told, there in that prison, there in that darkness, the Lord stood by Paul, both figuratively and quite literally. I had a chill go through me when I first read those words. The Lord stood by Paul. And this is what he said. Take courage. As you have testified in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The Lord is standing by his man. He's letting him know that he is in control of these circumstances. He is at work in these circumstances. He will carry out his purpose both for Paul and for the world. Don't be afraid. You're in and under my control and under my protection. I'm not finished with you yet. There's work that you will yet do. How oh, Paul must have been encouraged. The Lord stands by his witnesses. You and I have been called to be witnesses too. In the day of our baptism, we have a custom. After the person is baptized, they're presented with a candle, a lighted candle, and a charge. This is your mission. This is what you have been called to be now as God's person. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The Apostle Peter, writing to Christians living in Asia Minor, and writing at a time when many of them were having to answer for their faith, and sometimes having to give an account of their faith to a rather hostile audience. There was persecution. Some are even being put to death on account of their faith. Or like Paul, ending up in prison. He reminds them of the dignity of their calling. You are a chosen race. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood, God's own people, that you might declare the wonderful works of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. St. Paul received his commission in his baptism. Ananias is sent to the house where Paul is. Having seen Jesus, he's blind. Ananias is to go and baptize him. And why? God makes it very clear. Because he is my chosen instrument to declare me to the nations. So as the baptized people of God, we too are called to be witnesses. Now, hopefully, when we give our testimony, it won't be in such a threatening situation as Paul was facing there in Jerusalem or as those Christians in Asia Minor were facing in their day and age or that Christians face elsewhere in this world. As, for example, the Coptic Christians right now in Egypt. But then we don't choose the circumstances under which we give our testimony. The Lord 
arranges circumstances. He calls us at, to be witnesses in various times and in various places to various people with varying responses. And sometimes the people, as we give our testimony, may just politely listen and dismiss us. Or sometimes they may laugh at us, scorn us. Or sometimes they may even get upset with us or even threaten us. We're not responsible for the response. We're only responsible to be a witness and to be faithful in that witness. Even as we didn't choose the circumstances. Now, sometimes we are going to be put on trial not before a hostile audience or a threatening audience. Sometimes we are going to be put on trial by life circumstances that are rather threatening. Maybe a sickness or disease that comes into our life or threatens a loved one of ours. Maybe it's financial reversal. Maybe it's death. There are all sorts of things that can come that make us uncomfortable and our lives at risk. We don't choose those circumstances, but we can choose the way we respond to those circumstances. We can respond with quiet patience and confidence in the Lord, or we can respond in despair. We can bless God, or we can curse him. We can embrace the challenge and try to make the most of this situation to be a faithful witness in it. Or we can adopt a fetal position and wait to die. You choose. And as we react, to these circumstances that come into our life, that test our faith. The world watches. And they say, I wonder what he or she is going to do now. And the way that we respond either subtracts from our witness or it undergirds it and supports it. It's consistent. We heard in the second reading, always be ready to give an account of the hope that is within you. And as we face these life situations, we are, whether we put it in words or they just see in our, in our the way we are resp responding to that situation that there is hope within us, a confidence in God and confidence in his love that su sustains us. And it makes people want to know, where can I get that? Let me give you some examples. My wife serves on a district committee for the California, Nevada, Hawaii district. It's a task force for the development of ministry to people with disabilities. On that committee is a man named Art, and Art is a paraplegic and has been since he was 18. In fact, it was on his 18th birthday that he was celebrating by taking a backpack trip. Some kind of an accident, I don't know the details of the accident, took place during that trip, and he ended up rupturing the spinal cord and left with no use of his legs. Now, he, he had a long period of depression. In fact, he says every time he has a birthday, since it happened on his birthday, it's a time when he has to battle depression. But he also found a lot of encouragement through Joni Erickson Tata and friends, a ministry to people with disabilities. And there's no finer model herself than Joni Erickson, or some will say Johnny. Art decided that he was going to embrace the challenge of his disability to create ministry to others, 
with similar disabilities. In working with his congregation, he helped develop a ministry in that congregation, Holy Cross of Las Gatas, and they've developed a ministry that is a model for the whole district, and for that matter, a model for Synod. But largely, it was due to his leadership, his vision, his drive. One would say life gave him a bag of lemons. He decided, he chose, with the help of God, to make lemonade and give it away free. Corrie Tim Boom, in her book, Tramp for the Lord, tells of meeting a couple in, behind the Iron Curtain during the days of the Cold War. They were advanced in years, and the woman was so crippled with rheumatoid arthritis that all she could, the only digit, digit or arm that she could really use was this single finger. Her husband, each morning, would pick her up out of her bed, carry her to the sofa in the big room they had there, prop her up with pillows, put a rickety table in front of her, and an old typewriter, put a sheet of paper in it, and then she would sit there all day long, pecking away at that typewriter with the one finger that was good. What was she doing? She was translating devotional material into the language of her people. When she had finished typing it, the husband would fold it up, stick it in his coat pocket, and he would distribute it to people that he knew it would bless. Now, what the, this couple was doing was entirely illegal in that communist country. They could have faced dire consequences for it, but, you know, the authorities weren't watching. I mean, what harm can a little old crippled lady be Corey met the husband a few years later, and she inquired about his wife, and he said that shortly after their visit, when Corey had met her, she had died. He had gotten her up that morning, set her in the couch. She was typing away. To the glory of God, with that one finger, and God took her home. Many of you know my daughter, Stacy. She sometimes comes to church with us when we bring her home. And if you've ever watched her worship, you know that worshiping God is a real delight to her. She just loves the Lord. She loves to be with God's people, and she loves to worship. Recently, Elaine had to take her for an appointment with an ophthalmologist. We've discovered in the past year that uh, in... in Somehow or another, during all the seizures that she's had and the head knocks and things, that, that the retina in her left eye has detached, and she is legally blind in her left eye. They also discovered in her right eye that there's been some hemorrhaging, and so they're carefully monitoring that to make sure that it doesn't do damage, and she would lose sight in that eye. And that would be tragic, because right at this point in time, Stacy, at the age of 43, is finally learning how to read. And she just loves to read children's books. Well, she goes to this appointment. Now, Elaine and I are filled with all sorts of apprehension. What is the doctor going to find out? And you'd think that uh, Stacy would have... Uh, she understands what's going on. She sits there and she's chatting up the orthopedic, uh, orthopedic, the ophthalmologist. She's chatting him up. She says, you know, my father is a pastor and my mom was a Christian teacher. And together they were teaching people to know the love of Jesus for them. She said, they go to church every Sunday. They go to church every Sunday. Well, Hello. Breath of the Spirit wants to say something, something new, I guess. Anyhow, he says, uh, where was I? Hmm. Okay. Uh, she says, anyhow, I, I love to go to church because they go to church every Sunday. I love to go with them. And when I go to church, I'm very, very quiet because I want to hear what God has to say to me. Now, 
the ophthalmologist is a Middle Easterner. I have no idea what his faith background is or if there's any faith. But he's getting a testimony from someone who is just totally uninhibited and free to do it. Very bold. Some people would say that my daughter is retarded. I think in, spiritually there's some ways in which I'm more retarded than she is. And I'm a pastor. Well, you might say, I would like to be that kind of a witness and to have that kind of boldness that no matter what circumstance, what the situation, that I can give an account of the hope that is within me. But boy, if I had the confidence that Paul got that day in, in prison, that Jesus is standing right there with me, I would be so brave and so bold. I'd be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Remember? They put three men in, and they looked in there, and wait a minute, there's a fourth one. Who's that? Someone that looks like a, a son of a God. You know, he was the son of God. The Lord was stood with him. Hell, if I knew that Jesus was standing with me, I would be so brave and so bold. Who says he isn't with you? We have his promise, right? Did he not say to all of his witnesses, in Matthew chapter 28, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We may not be able to see them with these eyes, but with the eyes of faith, we know on the basis of his promise, he's there. Did we not hear, read this morning, this promise of the Lord? Don't be afraid of those who kill. They kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. Did not the Lord give us this promise on those times and occasions when we feel lost for words? Didn't he not say, don't worry about what to say or how to say it at the time when you're hauled before councils, synagogues, governors, and kings? You will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking that the Spirit of your Father. Matthew chapter 10. And again, don't we have the Lord's promise as his witnesses that when we feel like we don't have the strength to stand up to the circumstances we're having to deal with, don't we have this promise from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. No testing has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond what you can bear. But when you are tested, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Okay, you say. So he's with me. But maybe you're still feeling like that little girl caught in a lightning storm. She's actually at home. She's upstairs, second story. She's in her bed, but it's one of these Midwestern storms, and if you come from the Midwest or have spent any time back there, you know that the lightning storms we have in California are pretty wimpy. It really rocks and rolls in the Midwest. Well, it was one of those kind of storms. And she hollered down to her dad. Her dad was downstairs by the fire reading a book, Daddy, Daddy, I'm afraid. He says, you don't have to be afraid, dear. You're under a roof. The lightning cannot hurt you in the house. You're safe. Well, that quieted her for a moment until the next crack of lightning and thunder. Daddy, Daddy, I'm afraid. He says, you don't have to be afraid. God is with you. He'll take care of you. He'll keep you safe. She says, yeah, I know that, Daddy, but I need someone with skin on. So finally, Dad gets up, lays down on the bed with her, and soon she's fast asleep. Maybe you feel like that, too. I need someone with some skin on. 
You know, the Lord knows that. And from time to time, he will send people with skin on. You know, again, St. Paul, right at the very beginning of his ministry, he learned that. Right at the very beginning. He could not get a job in the church. He couldn't even become a dog catcher in the church because no one could trust him. After all, he was the one who had persecuted Christians. He couldn't get a job. Barnabas comes alongside, encourages him, and if it weren't for St. Barnabas, there would be no St. Paul. For that matter, there wouldn't be a whole lot of the New Testament food there. Later on in his ministry, Paul is in Rome, he's in prison, and he writes to the Philippian Christians, and he thanks them for the fact that they had sent Epaphroditus to him, bearing a gift. In fact, he brought a gift from the Philippians so that they might know that they were caring for him, loving him, praying for him. He brought a present, but he also brought a presence. And that's an important ministry. I can remember a time as a pastor when I was going through pretty tough dry period I was depressed it was a reactive depression in part because there were a lot of threats out there external threats but some of it was also in part what was going on in my own body I was so depressed one morning I could not get up and go to the office I called the secretary and said I won't be in today I'll try to get there tomorrow. Elaine had to go someplace, so she was gone, and I was sitting there having a royal pity party at home. There was a knock on the door, and I said, oh, for crying out loud, can't I have the, the luxury of at least having a quiet pity party just to myself alone? Opened the door, yeah, what do you want? Here's two fine ladies from the church, people with a well-earned reputation of being prayer warriors, and they said, Pastor, we've come to pray for you today. Now, I don't know how they knew I was so depressed, but they knew. The spirit in the body has a way of communicating that. And he sent the right people at the right time to stand by me and to pray with me and for me. And we got through that time. The Lord knows we need people to stand by us. And he will either stand there personally or will be at work in the circumstances in such a way that you can't deny that he is at work or he will put someone there beside you to be an encourager of Barnabas. I quoted from the movie Stand By Me when the narrator says, you know, I never had friends later on like the friends I had when I was 12. Jesus, does anybody? Yeah, that's just the point. We do. And Jesus is his name. And he will always stand by us in order that we can stand up for him. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.